I want to begin by sharing a story. It's the story of a woman called Diane Van Deeren. Should be a picture of her here. She is an ultra marathon runner. Uh, regularly would run 100 miles or more, 100 miles. Uh, in 2009, she won the Yukron Arctic Ultra, which is running through snow with a pack of 50 pounds sled behind you that you're towing, and it's for 300 miles. Temperatures regularly drop below 50, below zero, and she won the race. Now, Diane Van Deeren has an amazing story behind that because she only started running these ultramarathons after she'd had some surgery, some brain surgery, because she had struggled with severe epilepsy for 20 years. Uh, a portion of her brain had to be removed the size of a golf ball. And the uh, operation was a success in many ways, but one thing it did mean, the side effect, was that she lost the ability to work out where she was spatially which meant she didn't quite know all the time where she was, couldn't read maps. And you can imagine running an ultra marathon. She didn't always know where she was. And she'd say sometimes she'd run along, and often she'd be in the front. She'd get to a certain point, not knowing where to go next at this point, and would run for two hours in the wrong direction. They would have to run back where she'd run from, find out where that was, and go in the right direction. This happened twice to her. She still won the race. She came up with an idea to help her. She said, what I'm going to do, I'm going to carry some ribbons with me so that when I run and I get to a part of the race that I'm not quite sure where do I go, I'm going to put down a ribbon. And if I go and I find that I've gone off and I'm not in the right place, I come back to the ribbon and I work out where I should go so she doesn't go quite so far off course. She is an amazing person. And I tell that story firstly because there are some human beings around who just amaze us. We might think they're absolute nutters, but they do amazing things. But the second thing is that that story really illustrates something I want to begin with this new series we're looking at. And this new series over July is called Recover Your Life. Recover Your Life. Because for many of us, if we're honest in our lives, we are running in all sorts of different directions. And maybe we feel a bit disorientated. And we ask the question, am I going in the right direction? Maybe I need to work my way back to where I lost that direction. And over these next few weeks, we want to, as it were, look at a series of markers in the ground that Jesus gives us to help us to know we're in, on the right track as we are going through life. And the overarching uh, story or message is what Jesus taught us in a part of Matthew, which is quite a well-known passage, but I want to pick up on the message version of this passage, which goes like this, where Jesus says, are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me, get away with me, and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to make a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. It's a wonderful way of speaking that Jesus calls us into to reorient our lives along his path. And it's an invitation from Jesus to recover your life. Like in a marathon, if you can imagine running in the wrong direction, Jesus calls us back to him. So today as we begin over these next few weeks, what I want us to begin to look at is the passage that Bryn read to us, which really looks at kingdom simplicity. Kingdom simplicity. Now, when we're talking about simplicity, we're not just talking about simplicity for simplicity's sake, uh, a sense of decluttering the house or decluttering my wardrobe or even buying an electric car or growing vegetables. It's not that kind of simplicity, as good as that is. Jesus always goes way deeper with us. Jesus outlines in this passage for us where he says, 
Don't worry about your life. Don't worry about what you will eat, what you will wear. Don't worry, maybe today we think, what your mortgage increase might look like or the cost of living crisis. Because your father knows all these things. He knows you need these things. But then Jesus says, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things will be given to you as well. It's not that we don't know those things are there, but we don't need to worry about them, maybe as some of us do. In other words, don't spend your time, energy, and worry on these other treasures, but go after the treasures Jesus speaks of. So what I want to talk about today is in kingdom simplicity that we are going to exchange one treasure for another. We lay down our own treasures in life, and we're going to go after God's treasures. And I've got here two wonderful boxes as my illustrations. And as I begin, it's quite a big treasure, isn't it, this one? I want you to imagine this is all the things that you treasure in your life. Now, of course, we are all quite different. We would have different things that we might say are in our box, our treasures. And Jesus here is particularly talking about material stuff such as clothing and fashions and furniture. But for you, it might be other things in your life which are your treasures, hobbies, TV films, all sorts of stuff. Now, these treasures are not necessarily bad things, but they're things which maybe have attachments, we have attachments to, which are stronger than we should have. Richard Foster, who I'll be quoting a bit through this talk in his book, Kingdom Simplicity, says this. He says that we are so immersed in our culture that these treasures, the things in our lives, many of us are just not aware that they're treasures. He says the lust for affluence in contemporary culture is psychotic. We've lost touch with reality. So if we're honest, all of us, whether we say we are affected by treasures or not, are affected in some way, some more than others. And Jesus, in this talk, and again and again, says, these are the treasures, these are the stuff that often we focus our lives on and we're attached to. But Jesus offers us an exchange. And he says and talks about the treasures of God's kingdom. The treasures of God's kingdom. And I know that many of you will have heard this phrase before, seek first the kingdom of God. But I want to look a bit deeper at what that actually is. What are the treasures that Jesus speaks about? And in this um, book in Matthew, where Jesus is speaking, it's the only book that is written in Hebrew. Because Jesus, uh, Matthew is writing to a Jewish audience. So he writes this in Hebrew. And Why is that important? Because I want to draw out three Hebrew words which give us a bit of the depth of God's kingdom and his righteousness. It's not just a try to, well, read your Bible every day or pray every day. There's a real depth to what Jesus is saying. Seek first my kingdom. So the three words I want us to learn today are three wonderful Hebrew words. I look around and I see a few people who know a bit about Hebrew more than I. But the words are mishpat, chesed, and shalom. Mishpat, chesed, and shalom. Great words with real depth. So I want to give us a bit of an overview to understand what is it that Jesus is calling us to in his kingdom. First word, mishpat, righteousness and justice. Righteousness and justice. Jesus talks about pure righteousness, his right ways, his character, perfect wisdom for our relationships in all that we have, our families and our communities and our neighborhoods. We see and long for that to be around us in our communities and those amongst us. For those of you who watch the news, we've seen at the moment dominated by what's happening in France. And what's happening in France is dominated by a feeling of injustice. Those who are rioting, you might not agree with the way that what they're doing, but the underlying feeling is one of injustice. And it reminds me of when a great Christian leader stood up and talked about 
writing an injustice in his nation and around the world, and he spoke of his dream of what might happen. On August the 28th, 1963, in Washington, D.C., as many of you will know, Martin Luther King stood before a crowd of thousands and painted a picture of what true justice and true freedom might look like. And, after, and during his talk and towards the end of his talk, this is what he finished, what he was saying with. He said, when this happens, when this justice and this freedom comes, when we allow freedom ring, when we let it ring from every village and every hamlet, from every state and every city, we will be able to speed up that day when all of God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, we are free at last. The treasure and the kingdom that Jesus offers is justice and righteousness for all. That's one of those pictures that Jesus is speaking about. Second word, chesed, talks of loving kindness. We even had that phrase in one of the songs that we sang earlier. It's the loving kindness, the enduring kindness that Jesus brings. It's really been brought alive to me as I've been watching that program on the the internet or on the Prime, Amazon Prime, called The Chosen. And I love to watch it because the way they portray Jesus and how he meets different people He's just full of loving kindness. He comes across people who others shun or push to one side. And he just offers wonderful kindness. And you think, I love that person. I want to be like that person. The way he comes across Mary, the prostitute, and the tax collector, and Nicodemus, the the guy who's the... Uh, religious leader, and the lame man who's by the pool. Just the way Jesus looks at people and loves people and reaches out to people, it's full of loving kindness, and it's infectious. And it's the loving kindness which isn't just soft, but it takes Jesus to the cross and to the grave where he pours out his life for us. And when we see in our lives and in our community, just a small glimpse of this loving kindness, it really gets noticed. I was just looking at one uh, Wickham Facebook group that I happen to be part of, uh, and I saw this story, it was in Wickham just a few weeks ago, where somebody said, there is some good people left in the world. On Tuesday afternoon around five o'clock, I was waiting in the McDonald's drive-thru in Wickham near Sainsbury's. We placed our order and continued to go on and pay. When we got to the window to pay, the man told me the lady in front had paid for our order. So if you are that lady who has a red car and paid for my family's food, thank you. I was blown away by your kindness. And then she said the kindness was passed on to the people behind us. It might seem a very small thing but just glimpses of what the kingdom is like, where the kindness, the overarching kindness of Jesus shines through. And thirdly, in this treasure Jesus is speaking about, the word I want to pick up is shalom, which is often translated peace, but it's just a measure of what it is, peace. It's not just the absence of war and conflict, but rather, as Richard Richard Foster puts it this way, he said, shalom is a full-bodied concept that resonates with wholeness, unity, balance. And gathering in peace, it means a harmonious, caring community with God at its center as the prime sustainer and most glorious inhabitant. So this understanding of Hebrew simplicity is far more than just decluttering our homes It's not just having a peaceful night's sleep according to my Apple Watch or my Fitbit. It goes far deeper. It's much more profound, that deeper inner peace, that despite even turmoil around you and the circumstances that you face, when you recover your life, that is what 
you were designed for. And it's really what the world needs. It needs God's righteousness, his justice, his loving kindness, his peace, and his presence. So, here is the, pe- the treasure that we are often going after. The treasure that many of us aren't even aware of. And for a moment, let me ask you, what is it in your life that you'd recognize might be the stuff that Jesus is talking about? That you are focused on? That has maybe too much attachment in your life? Work? Even good things of family? And what we tend to do is we are focused on this stuff all week, and then we try and add Jesus in when we come on Sundays. So we pick up, or try to, pick up this and add it in and try and have the both. But Jesus very clearly says you cannot have both God and the word he uses is mammon, which is wealth, which is all the stuff around us. You can't have them both. But the deepest level, we know that that stuff isn't fulfilling, isn't ultimately joy-giving. So Jesus doesn't say, just add a little bit more treasure on with me around all the other stuff. When Jesus speaks, he declares war on the materialism of his day, on the treasures of his day. And this is what Jesus says, we read earlier. No one can serve two masters. What he's saying is either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. So we need to make the choice to lay down our treasures and to pick up God's treasures. And then the promise is, all this stuff Jesus will sort out anyway. He will provide all that we need Notice the word is need, not necessarily want. He provides all that we need. But it doesn't mean that kingdom simplicity is necessarily easy. Because we live in a world where God's kingdom turns the world upside down. So don't be surprised that in your life, in your work, in your family, life isn't always easy. Because Jesus didn't promise us an easy life, but he did promise a wonderful life. So what I want to do for the rest of the time is to look at some really practical things helped by this book from Richard Foster, where these are takeaways for us about the inward realities we need to have and the external things that we put into practice. This is how Richard Foster put it. He said that kingdom simplicity is an inward reality that results in an outward lifestyle. And both the inward and the outward aspects of simplicity are essential. Now, here's the thing I want to be clear of as an aside, that when we're talking about some of these things, about possessions particularly, they're not saying those are evil, but simplicity puts them in their proper perspective. We understand what they mean according to how Jesus sees those. So in this passage, Jesus is saying, saying, if you want to have freedom from anxiety, and we would all say we want freedom from anxiety, It's characterized by these three inner attitudes. The first one of these inner attitudes is to receive what we have, all that we have, as a gift from God. Everything we have is a gift from God. Now, yes, we go out to work, but it's not that we work that gives us all we have. We live by grace. We need to say we are dependent on God for everything, air, water, The sun, everything around us is received by God because of grace. Because when we're tempted to think, well, it's all about my labor, what I do, and how I provide for myself and family, etc. It's all about me. Well, all it takes, all it takes is just something to come in, whether it's drought or a health diagnosis or a financial issue. And then all of a sudden, it shows how utterly dependent we are for everything. So firstly, we receive everything we have as a gift from God. It's a pure gift. The second thing, the inner attitude, is to recognize this. It's God's business to care for what we have, not ours. 
It's God's business to care for all that we have, not ours. God protects all that we possess. We trust him with everything we have. For instance, we can put locks on our doors. We can have burglar alarms on our houses. But it's not that that protects our house. Now, of course, it's good that you have the normal precautions of locking your front door and locking your car. But if we believe those things protect our house, then we will be riddled with anxiety. Because as we all know, there's no such thing as a burglar-proof protection. It's the same for our reputations or for our employment or even for our children. I love the way that somebody called David Watson spoke about this. David Watson was a church leader from a number of years ago. And uh, he describes in his own life that he turned from a hard heart that he had in his 20s, became to be known as a great church leader, helped many churches across the UK. Many people came to faith through this wonderful man, David Watson. He even spoke at this church, I think, many years ago. But at the age of 50, he had cancer, and it was terminal. And he was on television just a few months before he died. And this is what he said. He said, well, I've said, Lord, here is my wife, my children, my possessions, my ambitions, my all. You can take them. The only place for peace and security for me in my heart is when I have all of that on an open palm. And I've talked to a few people recently who've been really stretched by circumstances that have come their way. And several of them said the biggest thing it's taught them is to hold things lightly and to trust God more fully. So kingdom simplicity is to trust God for all of these things. And then thirdly, the third inner attitude is that our stuff is available to others. Our stuff is available to others. And if you're picking up on the previous point, if our palms are open, it's easier to share rather than having palms like this. So it's saying our goods, our home, our stuff is available to be shared with others. My home is an open home for others to use. I lend my things freely and easily. A sign of a healthy church community is where things are shared and open and just people can... Share easily, openly, with all that you have. And we see that radically shown to us in the early church. In Acts 2, they talk about it by saying this. They said, all the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. And as a church here, we see, I see glimpses of that uh, amongst us. As we're building and growing some missional communities, I'd love that to be at the heart of who we are. It's not just a few meetings we go to, but it's living life together, sharing generously with one another. I can think of one family who were about or wanted to go to, on holiday, but their car had broken down. So somebody from the church family said, take our car and off you go. And they lent their car freely to them. I remember in our early days when we had a young family and and not a lot of money, but we were wanted to go to New Wine and a family just lent us their caravan and said, take this caravan. It was nearly brand new. It was wonderful. That freedom to use the property that God has given us and to share easily with others. So seeking kingdom simplicity is these three inner attitudes in our life. Everything is a gift from God. It's God's business to care for what we have and we share easily with others. And when we do that, begin to put those things into practice, we see what Jesus means by do not be anxious. Six times he says in that little passage we looked at, do not worry. Do not worry. So if you're the sort of person who is worried easily, put into practice those things, those inner attitudes. But you see, those three inner attitudes is not the ending place. We need to go to the next step which is to describe simplicity only as the inner reality is false. We need to have the external expression. It needs to look like something in our ordinary, everyday lives. Richard Foster, in his book, if you want to read it, gives you 10 options. I've chosen my top three. 
And I've added my own one in rather than the one he used because I see this more and more in our culture today. Three very simple things. These are not legalistic, but they might be things that you could use. Or if not your own, what are your outward expressions of how you put those inward realities into life? The first thing, really practically, buy things that are useful for their usefulness rather than their status. Buy things for their usefulness rather than their status. So you're buying a car. A car that's useful could be a Skoda rather than a BMW. Just saying. Nothing about the good or right of those cars. But what are you looking for? Because we are so often brand driven. We have a shirt with a label on which says something about who I am. Our identity. When buying a house or an apartment... Choose livability, not how much it impresses others. Don't necessarily buy more living space than you need. For clothes, most of us, I'm the same, we have wardrobes, far more stuff than we can ever use. We don't need more stuff, living simply. We buy often not because of need, but because of fashion. Wear your clothes until they wear out. Stop trying to impress people with your clothes and your life. So get things for their usefulness, not status. Secondly, this one goes a little bit deeper, I think. Reject everything that is producing an addiction in you. Reject everything that is producing an addiction in you. Now, often we might think of the obvious kind of addictions, but it's far deeper than what that actually is. So we can think of alcohol and other things, but chocolate, etc. But there are many things that we are addicted to that maybe we don't even realize. Netflix, TV. Biggest addiction, I think, for many. I think the younger you are, the more addicted you can be. Try and take a phone off a teenager. I, I, I'm, I recognize how much, I'll come back to that in a minute, how much the addiction can be of something like that. Because simplicity is freedom, not slavery. Addiction is something that is beyond your control. So, for instance, we know that by your will alone, you will not change and break that addiction. So we need to ask the Spirit of God to help us. We need to ask friends to help us. For those, I know there's a number of people here who are in AA. There's a wonderful network of support. You need people with you. Will alone will not do it. Be ruthless. So how do you discern if you have an addiction or not? The phrase I like is an undisciplined compulsion. An undisciplined compulsion. It's like a habit You cannot seem to stop. So, for instance, the other day, I went out for the day without my phone. As soon as I realized, I started twitching, realizing, well, how will I cope? What if someone rings me? What about how will I check the news? What if the weather? All these little things, which are stupid things in many ways, but the phone has become so attached to us. So my question to you is, What addictions do you have? Or to take the word out of addictions, because that might be a bit of a leading word, what habits do you have that are undisciplined compulsions? Do you have to have that glass of wine every night? Do you see how many likes I have to have on that post? Does my house have to be spotless? You could fill in the blanks for whatever it is for you. So reject any addiction. And thirdly, beware of the danger of distraction. Beware of the danger of distraction. This is one that I've added in that Richard Foster didn't have, but because I see it in my life, and I see so many others with that. I struggle with distraction so much. I I can be on this wonderful thing and you're on Instagram and you look at one reel and suddenly 20 minutes have gone. Where's that time gone? Distraction of the phone. Very simple thing in the morning. I love to get up first thing in the morning, sit by the window, and I spend half an hour plus reading scripture and praying. Problem is, 
my app that I use is on my iPad. And from the time I'm using an app, and I've read that scripture, it's been so helpful, I find that I'm now looking at the news app as I go from that to pause, or the WhatsApp, or the weather app, and all these different distractions so easily flood in, and I forget what it was I was praying about in the first place. So if you're someone who is, you recognize distraction is something I struggle with. It's not unique to me, and it's not unique to you. We are probably the most distracted culture in human history. We have no end to the amount of devices, apps, streaming services, emails. We're so consumed with distraction, we cease then to listen to our hearts. When I forgot my phone, I was standing in a queue waiting for something. And I wondered, well, what am I going to do with myself when I'm standing here waiting? Because if you look around, everybody was on their phones. We don't have time to pause and be still because there's so many distractions. There's a book that I would love to recommend for you if this sort of thing would help you. It's on the bookstore called The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. I'm going to come back to this in the next few weeks. And John Mark Comer, the writer, says in that book that we, for every kind of reason, good or bad, are distracting ourselves into oblivion. And he goes on to quote another writer called John Ortberg, who says this, For many of us, the great danger is not that we will renounce our faith, it's that we will become so distracted and rushed and preoccupied that we will settle for a mediocre version of it. We will just skim our lives instead of actually living them. Skimming our lives rather than actually living them. And although distraction is huge in our culture, it's nothing new. It's nothing new throughout history. It's just there's more distraction around today. Jesus knows we are so easily distracted. There's a wonderful story. You may well know it. Jesus comes to a home. There's Martha and Mary in this home. Mary sits before Jesus to listen and be with him. Martha is scurrying around doing all sorts of stuff. And she comes up to Mary and says, Oi, get on task. We've got all this stuff to do. These people here, we've got guests. And she says to Jesus, get my sister to help me. Get her on task. And this is what we read. Notice the wording Jesus uses. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. There is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken away from her. There's many things that we can be distracted with, but will you focus on seeking first the kingdom of God, of seeking first Jesus and his kingdom and all his treasures and all these other things, he says, will be taken after by your father. So how do you recover your life? What does kingdom simplicity look like for you? Well, Jesus says, come to me. What? exchanges can you make? What's Jesus been saying to you this morning, the, the thing that he's putting his finger on, the exchange that you need to make as you maybe recognize this thing, this habit, this treasure has too much of a focus on my life. I've gone down this trail for too long. I need to come back to where Jesus is calling me, back to the simplicity of the kingdom life, of focusing on the things that Jesus has for me. Not because you are a good person, but because Jesus is calling us to his life of righteousness, justice, and grace. So will you recover your life? Jesus says, my way, if you follow my way, will keep you sane, it will keep you healthy, and it will keep you joyful. Because Jesus is for you. Because many of us, a lot of the time, if you're like me, our life seems to be a bit of a train wreck. This and that and the other. And we just get our lives away from Jesus' simplicity of how we live. So Jesus says, I've made a way for you. I've shown you how to live. I've described it and I've given you a path through the cross to life. You don't do this on your own strength. You don't have to make your own way. To recover your life, 
You have to choose to lose it. And then you get all the treasure God has for you poured in. Shall we stand together? Let's stand. If I can ask the band as well if they want to come up.